we'll get our call started as close to on time as we are. But this is a this is a big training. It's the final training in our series of trainings focused on deepening our strategic thinking and, and getting our state ready to ratify. And I know it's been a while since our last one of these. Um, we were in that monthly cadence, a uh, little online conference and little citizen lobby days interrupted us a little bit here. Um, some people had lobby day meetings just, just last week. Alan had a lobby day meeting with Representative Kinzinger per oh, nice. ma many of your good mm -hmm. suggestions um, just today. So it's it's been a, a prolonged stretch of, of really good activity, but we've gotten, um, we got sidetracked and, and now we're back, now we're back on the rails um, in these ready to, ready to ratify training. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, remember our first training, we, we focused on effective research and analysis strategies. Our, our second training covered how to take that research and analysis and think strategically about the network that we want to work to bring in, an influential network of advocates based on our research and analysis. The third training, we did a deep dive into campaign goal setting and plotting activities out on a timeline, working backwards from success of the campaign goal. Um, I'm just gonna quickly, very quickly, share my screen and, and plop this in, in the chat, but um, this was the mock campaign plan that we laid out. We had our campaign goal up in the upper left-hand corner, and we identified a couple of categories that were useful to track, um, you know, doing research in these couple months, um, demonstrating support from these particular organizations, the strategic networking and June, July, and August, um, you know, having specific legislative goals for number of meetings that we're having, specific media goals for number of letters to the editor that we're having, um, same with op-eds, and, and then really the most important thing, how are we consistently growing our chapter, things like, you know, well, we're going to have our friend banking training on in June, and we're going to leverage that into a, a place for new people to come in um, and learn really basic but inspiring information about our chapters and our chapters work. Um, we don't, we're not going to dive into all of this again, but just as a reminder, this is what we talked about in the third training. Um, and hold on one second here. Tonight, what we're doing is we're combining the fourth and fifth trainings. Um, in, into one final training. And the focus here is rolling out and leveraging state campaigns to victory. And we'll talk through what this means and, and how we can think about it in a minute. But first, I, I would like to acknowledge that we have a new team member here tonight. Most everyone I'm sure has, has met him in various capacities, but American Promise's new states manager, Alan Law Police is here and is going to help lead this training. And Alan's been advocating for this amendment for years, um, long before he started formally working on American Promise and, and brings with him a wide array of experience, everything ranging from service in the army, uh, as an educator, as a fifth generation, generation Kansas farmer, and as a three-time congressional candidate. So Alan, thank you for being here. And it's customary that we kick off our meetings hearing people share about why they're involved in this work, what their personal motivation is. And uh, can you quickly kick us off here and share what it is that drives you to, to be in this fight for a constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics? And, and then we'll hear from some others on the call. I would enjoy that. Um, so I was involved with the 28th Amendment before I knew that this organization existed, before I knew that anyone else was talking about it. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I ran three congressional campaigns. Um, my service in the military kind of led me to believe that there was more service to be done. Um, I you know, grew up in, in um, north central part of Kansas, and at the time uh, that I got involved, we had a pretty, pretty ineffective congressman that uh, his entire purpose was to obstruct and to push hyperpartisanship to, to new limits. Um, this was before you know, the new Congress. Um, so I, I got involved in uh, a Republican primary, actually the first time I, I billed myself as an Eisenhower Republican, and jokingly I would say that an Eisenhower Republican today would be to the left of Bernie Sanders. 
Um, but I did quite well. I actually did quite well in the first primary. I nearly beat the incumbent on a message of bipartisanship, a message of good reform, uh, you know, uh, education policy, infrastructure spending, good stuff. But in that process, I found out quickly that the only metric that DC was measuring was campaign finance, how much money you were raising and from who. And because my congressman was pretty disliked by the establishment, I got support from a lot of the establishment but then the establishment had a very specific ask and it was that you will be loyal to us or we will withhold money. And that's when I began um, my quest to overturn that process. And that's when I began talking about the 20th amendment. And I ran that race three separate times. Um, the second time was as an independent. And I learned that both parties uh, disfavored independence. And then I ran it as a Democrat because I was asked to by a couple of former democratic governors and each time it, I learned the lesson more and more that it's just about the money. And so um, I went to a conference in Nashville and I was kind of doing my thing and I met Jeff Clements and he magically was talking the same thing I was talking. And then he showed me the book and I thought, this is the place. So I've been involved with the 20th amendment before I knew of American Promise. And now I'm very proud to be very much uh, jumping in, you know, uh, all the way with, um, you know, pushing for the 20th Amendment. Super. Th thanks, Salad. And, you know, it's relatively new here, but it, you've, you've plugged right in truly seamlessly. Um, it's, it's made my job much easier and, and improved the organization pretty, pretty much immediately. Um, so, so great to have you here and um, would, would love to hear from a couple other people on this call share what it is that motivates them to be in this really simple, really easy work of amending the constitution. <laughs> All right, kick us off here, Joan. And, and to say where you're calling in from is always, is always great. Uh, my name is Joan DeVore. I'm calling from Southern New Jersey and I'll keep it real simple. It's for my, for, for my daughter and for our country. I really think that this is the linchpin of, of, um, turning our democracy around uh, to getting back to being uh, non -dis uh, less dysfunctional. That's the short and sweet of it. Oh, for, for future generations, for young family members. And for us now, mm -hmm. it seems more and more important every, every day almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I know you're not alone in, in that being the driving the driving reason is, is there anyone else who'd like to share here? Yeah, go My for it. My name is Robbie Duda oh. and I'm from Michigan. And I in this because I just think that the, with all this money, it has fostered, all this excess money has fostered people doing crazy things with it. And it is just, just, upended our civility in our society mm -hmm. and I can't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you could uh yeah you could tune out and watch TV and not read the news or you could you know say you I'm gonna you when go us, back, you know once yeah. you know something you can't go back. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just not good at it. Even though I worked as a psych nurse for years and years, I never learned how to do it. <laughs> Super well, well, yeah. Thank, thanks for being here and the healthcare providers for American Promise. I know it's really exciting. Um, we had know, our it, first it, coffee and chat last night. It's, it's, We're the healthcare network. And exciting. fantastic. Um, that, that's just phenomenal. And Laura, I know you had your hand up here. Uh, well, some of you have heard this before. I think um, the the moment that I realized it wasn't just one one industry for one cause, but really every sector of our lives um, started to enumerate the, the, the different components. Um, I, was, I was a pharmaceutical executive for 25 years. I understand well that relationship that pharma has to the government and in terms of regulation and things like that. But it's not, it's not the same with foods, it's not the same with pesticides, it's not the same with our air and water quality, personal finance products, how you pay for schooling, 
whether or not you get a, a car loan, fairness in all kinds of housing. It's uh, it, every, bit, every bit of everything we touch all day long is, can be, troubles can be traced pretty clearly back to influence of uh, legal entities, not people. And that's just not in alignment with the country we want to be, I think. I think most people would say that. So uh, we've got to fix it across the board. And that's why an amendment is, is important. Super. Th thanks, Laura. Yeah, you know, no matter what it is, you're trying to figure out why is this, you know, not as functional as I know it could be. Uh, this big foundational problem is, you know, likely one of one of the big reasons why uh, it's, it's hard to incur the progress that seems like it should be possible if our system was was totally um, righted and there was an even playing field. I, I see that Beverly has her hand up. I'll go ahead, Beverly. Sure. Um, two reasons very succinctly. Um, it's a huge waste of $14 billion. The last round costed, cost that much. That money could have been better spent, you know, in humanitarian and nonprofit work, most of it. Um, and secondly, I believe that uh, this, the big money and politics is both driving and reinforcing income inequality in the United States, it, hollowing out our middle class and um, really diminishing our prospects for democracy going forward. Um, democracy requires a robust middle class. It can't function. <clears throat> we'll become a two-class society and a, um, a democracy in name only, you know, on the model of Mexico or Pakistan if we continue on this path. Super. Thanks, Beverly. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, other countries and, you know, they don't spend $14 billion or as, as much money per capita as, as we do. Um, it's certainly not the only, the only way to go about having an election. I, I see Gary has his hand up. So go ahead, Gary. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Norris. I'm calling from uh, Western Washington. I sort of uh, came here after thinking about all the problems we face as a country for a while. And I sort of eventually figured out that they all pretty much tie back to the two-party system's unwillingness to solve them. And that really the best way to do that is to get a constitutional amendment to uh, reform the two-party system. And uh, after trying to advocate for one, uh, an amendment on my own to my high school class, unfortunately, I overestimated the political willingness of high schoolers. I uh, looked around mm -hmm. online and found American Promise. So now I hope to... Uh, take action with you cool thanks thanks for being here gary what what hey. part of what part of washington are you in um, specifically uh everett washington it's north of seattle of uh, 45 minutes cool um we, cool. Should, we should we should connect <laughs> offline I'll, I'll be in seattle in the fall um oh cool cool thank you everett mm -hmm. everett always beat us in high school baseball uh, but, <laughs> yeah, i don't really follow my high school sports mu much though good <laughs> they're they're beating garfield high school um all right well thank 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 you guys for for sharing here it's always really uh, important reminders and good practice of of you know how we communicate with others about why this is important to us and why this is important to other people to to care about themselves so um we're, we're gonna dive right into it now and we're gonna dive right into what, what it is that we mean when we say let's, let's roll out and leverage a state campaign to victory. And the real question that we're thinking through tonight is how can we turn one action into another action? And how can we make the impact of those two actions be greater than the sum of their parts? And, you know, each state is different each set of decisions is different, but the, this is a constant that, you know, we can really think strategically about leveraging one action into another. Um, that if we do some front end planning will allow us to have a greater impact um, than simply having two events in, in a vacuum with one another. And 
before Alan walks us through this and, and engages us in conversation around this in a couple of minutes, I, I just want to emphasize a really important step that will really help with this process. And that's understanding the current resources that you have um, when going into putting together any plan. And, you know, resources is a big, broad word. And I think it's helpful to think of, about your resources in a couple of ways. <clears throat> The first um, training that we did together in this series was all about research and analysis. And information is an enormous resource that we, that we can't overlook. Um, we think about the existing support structures that um, American Promise provides, you know, Marnie and Dr. Jessica um, setting up the friend banking team, for example, which you know, Vicki Barnes is, is helping to lead, I believe, monthly on the third Thursday of the month. Um, similar to the writing letters to the editor team, um, which Ann Drum is, is helping to lead on the fourth Thursday of the month, the organizing events and organizing events team led by Laura, Nittmeyer, and, and Ann on the first Tuesday of the month. All, all of this is written down in the social media team and the meeting with elected officials team. Um, you know, these, these are all resources um, for, for you and your chapters to be thinking about, oh, you know, okay, we've got five new people. You know, let's, rather than me train them how to meet with elected officials or use social media or organize events or all of these things, these are existing structures that people can be supported by um, without, you know, Herculean efforts on the back of, you know, one chapter leader, or one or two chapter leaders. So really just thinking, um, through these trainings as, as consistent resources um, for you and your chapter and these strategic plans is an important thing that we don't want to overlook. Um, and I just wanted to make that point um, really clearly emphasized here as just having a, a seriously accurate um, audit of, of your existing resources before going into executing a serious campaign on a timeline. Um, it's going to make your life um, e easier and going to allow you to, to accomplish more. So um, before I turn it over to Alan here, um, any additional thoughts on, you know, resources that I might be, I might have missed, um, or any questions on, you know, thinking through this sort of concept as what are the resources that I have at at my disposal uh, before I launch into a um, targeted political campaign with a specific goal. Yeah, I see that Robbie has her hand up. So go ahead and unmute yourself there, Robbie. Mute, unmute. There's other, other groups in our, our state that are, you know, helping us with this. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think they're a great resource. <laughs> de de definitely. Yeah. You know, your, your existing contacts, um, or even, you know, your knowledge of other groups that exist that you could be connected with. Um, you know, we're not the only ones working to better our democracy. We're not the only ones who care about a constitutional amendment. So yeah, that's a great point. But, uh, yeah, John. There's also the um, the resource library on the website. So uh, with lots of um, information so you don't have to reinvent the wheel for messaging and and that type of thing. that that's right. yeah, resource resources in the name. Um, there's there's a wealth of information in that resource library. Um, and as always, um, you know, when you see something that is missing from it or could use improving um, to let Marnie or Dr. Jessica or, or Alan or anyone on the American Promise team, um, just a flag that, you know, this is a resource repository that, that is consistently um, improving um, because of people using it and, and saying what works and what doesn't work. So um, thank, thank you for adding those, those things. Definitely the resource library, existing contacts and you know potential other groups really smart to be thinking through these sort of as one 
big category of what are my resources going into a campaign. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Alan to, to continue this discussion. Thanks, Alan. It is uh, truly my pleasure to be with such a great group tonight and to be working with such a great organization to accomplish this minor goal. Um, I hope that we together can translate all of the trainings and all the work that you've done up until now and um, translate that into a, a, a really effective rollout and then um, a leveraging of the campaign to achieve our shared goal. Um, and our goal is, of course, uh, the amendment. And to pass the amendment, uh, you all remember that we need at least two thirds of the vote and our goal is by 2024. Uh, and then we want it approved by at least 38 of the 50 states, no later than 2026, which should be a piece of cake. I wanna give a minute to uh, Laura in the chat has said that resources include members with organizational skills and writing skills, this is very true. And then she also says time is the most important resource and that is difficult to get right. So time, keep keep track of the time. Um, and with that, I, I'll, I'll talk about the goal and how you're gonna work backwards from that goal and manage that time as best you can. But specific to, to rolling out your campaigns, uh, your goals are gonna be more targeted for your particular state or your partic a particular district within your state. Uh, you may be targeting the federal delegation or members of it. Uh, you might be getting them on board you may be just trying to keep them on board. Uh, you may be targeting your state legislature. Uh, your, your goal may be to pass uh, an initiative or a state amendment or even a ballot measure. These are lofty goals, but they're all doable. And then some of you may just be raising the visibility of American Promise and the 20th Amendment. Uh, you may be working with those other state organizations and the media to increase the awareness of, of our organization of your chapter and then of the amendment more broadly. So whatever your particular chapter or personal goal is, it's important to use that resource of time, set timelines, work backwards, including each of the previous phases of ready, ready to ratify. Uh, you'll need to be flexible because everything is flexible in this, in this task, but be diligent and don't you lose your steam. Don't lose your, your, your hope that you're gonna accomplish your goals. You wanna keep on top of that research. Azar mentioned the research and I gotta tell you in politics, the most valuable thing is that research, it's data. That's why you get so many emails from politicians and from organizations. Uh, the research, good data is worth its weight in gold. Uh, you always want to work to maintain the chapter, the volunteers, the people that you've got and you wanna always be expanding on that network. And then always be plugging away with your letters to the editor. Uh, if you're doing pledges, get pledges from people, get pledges from business partners, uh, go out and uh, do signature drives to get people of, involved. Uh, hold legislative meetings, do your outreach. Just keep in mind that uh, our goals are around the corner and the midterm election cycle, it's already begun. The midterms are literally just around the corner. So my job is to define the rollout. <clears throat> um, up until now, all of the research that you've done, the networking, the campaign buildup, uh, all of this has been mostly internal to your chapter, to your organization or to our organization. Uh, it hasn't been public. You haven't, if you haven't rolled out a campaign or if you haven't rolled out your event, you have been private. All of your efforts have been sort of internal. The rollout is going to be taking it all public. So I think this is a great time to ask you, um, what are your ideas of what a public rollout would look like? Or if you've already done it, what did your public rollout look like? So anybody raise a hand, I'll, I'll call on you and ask you to unmute. Oh, I asked a tough question. So you're rolling it out publicly. What, what, might, what might that look like? What's a rollout? Joan. I'm just thinking out loud here because we really don't have it together, but I think um, after the legislative visits, we have to tie in that visibility we've got with the legislators to a strategy of having events with the public and letting legislators know, you know, inviting them to come to events, inviting them to sort of 
link the grassroots up with them, mm -hmm. so that the, so that not only the, pu the 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 public gets educated and the legislator gets educated to see how their the public support is growing. Yeah, yeah. You 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 have to legislators. Um, they respond to money, but they also uh, they'll respond to public opinion polls. They'll respond if they get a thousand emails in their inbox that um, you know, hey, we're concerned about this, and what are you doing to uh, to, to to respond to it? So yeah, your public rollout is you making your voices heard, making it known that that your chapter uh, has this goal of you know getting your state ready to ratify, getting your legislature, getting your um, getting everybody that's involved at the, at the state level on board, but then also getting your your federal delegation. To support the amendment. Uh, any other ideas of what what a public what what you could do? Um, an event, a meeting. A, I, I jokingly said a a, a a a celebrity football game. You know, just Gary. What do you have in mind? Um, I thought uh, one really effective way to sort of make the general public realize the significance of the Twenty Eighth Amendment is to dem is to point out all the different other political issues, say climate change, for example, that are being impeded by how the two-party system currently works because a lot of times there's at least one issue someone is passionate about and if you can point out how a 28th amendment would be essential to uh fixing that problem they would uh people would be on board for it exactly exactly this might be issue one to getting any other issue whether you're in a red district a blue district a red state uh you know uh very progressive very conservative it makes no difference if you can call attention to the fact that our Congress isn't getting anything done and we know why, that's you going public. That's you saying, hey, we're aware and um, uh, we, have, we have an alternative to this. We have a solution. Vicki, unmute, please. Um, well, we're uh, in Minnesota, uh, Vicki Barnes, Minnesota. Um, we are following up with our lobby day with some op-eds that we're working on right now, but um, we are also working on local resolutions mm -hmm. in uh, the purple areas. And um, in addition, we're going to be targeting three or four purple counties and uh, see if we can uh, rent a spot there at the county fair, which is a big deal in Minnesota and have maybe a stand where people can come and sign petitions and educate them about the amendment process so that we can get some traction there with their local and state uh, and federal uh, representatives. Yeah, perfect example. Uh, county fairs, state fairs, especially after, you know, uh, a year long uh, lockdown, it, it is, uh, it's good to get out there. It's good to be public. And I'll, I'll wager that um, there's a lot of media out there, uh, local reporters, uh, local TV, uh, and if you're out there and there's a crowd around your booth signing signatures and you have a, a well thought out statement to give, you'll find your chapters on the nightly news. Excellent, excellent. Any, anything else? Because we, we don't have the answer for every state. We don't have the answer for every chapter. Sometimes you may have to find what that, what that goal is gonna be, the rollout. What does it look like uh, for your chapter? Laura. Thank you. Okay. Where you from too. Um, thanks. Um, I was going to say my main point to you, Alan, was was going to be um, yes, the publicity uh, stage is actually uh, the time when you really feel like you're that really feels like the rollout, even though the bulk of the work has already been done. So, example, the candidate pledge we did last summer, um, culminating in press releases going to. Uh, all, all over the place in California. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm very interested in what um, Gary has just brought up about using the 20th Amendment to talk about how the current system doesn't address or what is not going to address. That it dovetails in, in with what I was saying before about so many different sectors. So I think my question is, um, do we see a role for uh, communication where um, many, many issues are, are brought up all at one time versus uh, communications 
up to now have typically been along the lines of here's one problem that is impeded by the 28th amendment or, or by it shows the need for the 28th amendment and how this will be the situation will be rectified when it's solved that would just maybe just speak into one audience at a time so my question is communications uh with what issues one at a time versus having a whole bunch of them all together in one communication the value of that that's an excellent question and i actually will call on gary to to elaborate but let me say this as a preface um, american promise is agnostic to all issues uh, we are agnostic to all other concerns uh, that may arise, uh, whether it be climate change, social justice, um, wealth inequality, all of those things can be addressed. All, the, all those things should be addressed. Uh, but when speaking directly from as, as American Promise, uh, our goal is to address that singular issue of the, the, the corruption of the political system due to Citizens United and the dark influence of dark money. So. I would just uh, uh, advise caution in ro uh, rolling this issue into a climate issue, rolling this issue into any other of the social issues that you'll turn people off. But when you talk about the political corruption and the need to resolve it, you're going to find extreme bipartisan support and unlikely that you're going to be sitting next to a billionaire who starts arguing that money is speech and he has a right. You know, if he's there, you can you can lobby him. But uh, the other issues we uh, we we are agnostic to. Gary, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? You're right. You were absolutely right. But as far as your rollout. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I had, I guess, almost sort of envisioned was more specifically reaching out to other uh, movements already protesting, because there's a lot of different people to while they may care about an issue they might not necessarily be willing to uh spend a lot of time doing it so we uh, one thing is we could reach out to other activists who would also and maybe steer them over to our side um that could i guess manifest itself in having sort of a convention between us and all sorts of other activists the only problem i see could that could come up with that uh, which i think we should address is that not all activists of all movements will necessarily play nice with each other. I mean, you could get some liberals and conservatives of different movements and they might not play well. So that is an issue that could come up, but I don't think that's necessarily a big enough problem to where we should just throw that idea away altogether. I think it could be solved. Maybe if we like do maybe have a convention for the liberal leaning movements and one for the conservatives maybe or something, I, I don't have all the answers. I have kind of an idea, but yeah. It's, it's worth investigating. I see Azer smiling, I don't know if you want to comment, but um, with your rollout, I would recommend uh, maintaining that singular focus. I would maintain, I would I would really stay on target for, you know, we're, we're into the amendment. We are nonpartisan. We are not a group of, of um, left-leaning. We're not a group of right-leaning. We are, we are Americans and we believe that this is essential to all of the other reforms, be they uh, from the left or right. Uh, Augie had his hand up. I definitely want to, I don't want to get bogged down too deep, but Augie, you, you've been waiting for a bit. Yeah, I, I think it would be good to uh, try to uh, find opportunities to go and speak to other established groups where this is not necessarily their, this isn't necessarily their primary area of interest, but whether it be the Rotary Club, the Sierra Club, indivisible groups, uh, move on groups. I've mentioned most of those except Rotary Club tend to be on the left. Uh, I'm not so familiar with the groups on the right, but uh, still uh, to find opportunities to try to uh, make a presentation to these various groups and uh, uh, to get them on board to get people from each of these groups uh, involved in participating so you can uh, you know uh, as opposed to just trying to put together an event for the general public I mean general public's one idea but sure. uh, people that are already involved in other groups are more likely to get involved as opposed to your average person that's really not involved in anything 
Well, this goes back to the research. If you're going to do a presentation at a Rotary Club, you know your audience. Uh, and as long as you're right. maintaining that singular focus, yeah, speak to the audience. And if it's, yeah. if it's, um, you know, if it's a, a chamber of commerce, chamber of commerce, you know, you know where they're at, you're probably going to know who's on it. Uh, if you're talking to uh, an environmental group or a fishing group or, a, you know, know your audience, but know that our purpose expands to everything else. But our singular goal is just the 20th Amendment. And what we'd like that to be is targeting um, money and politics, uh, just the, right. the idea that speech is protected by the Constitution and everything else will come later. I don't want to get too bogged down, so I'll go quickly. Uh, Laura, did you have a comment? You brought up a, a hot issue. No, okay. Uh, Beverly? Unmute, please. Quickly to Gary's point, um, you know, a lot of chapters are having trouble getting an equal number of Republicans on board. We are uh, cross-partisan. So we don't want to um, tilt for too far to the left. But um, Jim Rubens, who is a board member of American Promise, has written a beautiful exposition of the conservative case for a 28th Amendment that it would be very difficult for um, conservatives to, to disagree with and liberals would be instantly on board. So you don't necessarily need to appeal to somebody's interest in climate change or gun control or whatever it might be. Um, that The arguments that he lays out and he lays out three, four, five of them are so compelling and so solid that I think we can just stick to the issue of the 28th amendment and the role of money in politics without having to um, appeal to secondary issues to win support for the amendment. Excellent point. And I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and they are eloquently laid out. And I've been, they, they asked me to, to go to the lobby day meetings with Republicans uh, because I understand the language. And if you couch the amendment in the 10th amendment, federalism, you're trying to restore to the states that which the Citizens United decision took away from the states. You're trying to return to the legislature that which wasn't in the constitution, but we're going to say, you can't say that money is protected speech because now it's in the constitution. So it really does ring with, with, with conservatives uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a federalism frame. So it's, yes. it's good to, if you want to deviate from our main talking points, Jim Rubens are, are, are right They're They're still online. They're perfectly online. Yeah. John, did you have a real quick comment? And then I wanted to move on. Quick, and, and really I'm, I'm actually referring to, to what Vicki put in the chat about, about people being able to have their voices heard. I think mm -hmm. that the need for people to have their voices heard is something that can resonate with people across the, the uh, political spectrum. It is, I mean, it, it resonates with the population. We, we've got uh, uh, analysis that, you know, 80% of the population, including almost 70% of Republicans, agree on this issue as being uh, you know, a singularly important issue and they would agree to the amendment. It's just getting Congress to uh, pass the amendment and the states, or at least the plurality, the, you know, the majority of them to ratify. So that's our focus. All right, let me continue on with the rollout because we have to talk leverage as well. Uh, but let me say, um, again, you've got resources. The resources include your personnel, the people that are volunteering. You always wanna be expanding your rosters. You wanna be getting more people involved. That's why going to these events is great. It's, it's a public appearance, but it's also recruiting new troops. Um, but when you get the volunteers, when you get people that are willing to sacrifice that time and their energy, um, give them duties, responsibilities, uh, assign them roles, be clear on what the roles are. You've got someone that's great at writing, that person's writing letters to the editor, that person's uh, developing you know, op-eds and, and, and working on the writing skills. If you've got somebody that's great at organizing or talking to people, or you know, you've got somebody that's great at baking, you know, find a way to put them to use, find a way to put that into the, 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 you know, your chapter meetings, your public events, uh, and your rollout generally. So keep people busy, keep people active, keep them involved, uh, and be sure they know what their roles are. And then check, double check, train, retrain. Um, make sure they haven't missed any pieces. You know, if you if you get to the signature gathering and you don't have any pens, that's going to be a problem. So always stay on top of that. Um, might be a good time to just ask real quick. Any hurdles that you can think of to a rollout? Anything like I mentioned, just um, 
what 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 may stop you from from doing a public rollout? Is there anything that that you've already experienced that's worth mentioning? Yes, Joan. Time. Yeah, that you know, that. that's that's it. You, you uh, time creeps up on you, and you it's this um, resource that just uh, it it slips by. So yeah, stay on your uh, your schedule. Stay on your your you know. Stick to the plan, stick to your timelines. And um, uh, if something doesn't work out, quickly move to the next thing. Uh, Vicki, did you have a question? Or a comment well, actually, about I was gonna say, one of the biggest obstacles is that there's so many other advocacy issues that compete with this. And um, I'm, I'm really about to double down here in Minnesota and say that all of these issues are because of money and politics and, and really hold people's feet to the fire and say, if you wanna do something about that issue, then you need to, I just said it from the beginning, you know, go ahead, spend 90% of your time on, on the issue you're most passionate about. But if you're not spending at least 10% of your time trying to get money out of politics, you will never, never succeed. So uh, I think we need to double down on, on the fact that this money in politics is the issue behind every single issue. And it seems like, you know, the media you know, is telling us what's a crisis by what they, they put their emphasis on all the time. And people suddenly are galvanized to go work on a certain issue. And that's, you know, we're being manipulated uh, into to working on things that are not gonna solve, uh, the, we're not gonna be able to solve without getting money out of politics. So yeah. I think that's the biggest obstacle and the biggest hurdle that we have to, to try and get people to really come in and support this. It's not a sexy issue, it's, you know, but, but it's not a constant issue either. It's small bursts of activity. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, unless you're leading the group, it's not a constant job. So I think that's the, the biggest thing that, you know, the most difficult thing to overcome is to make this the issue uh, that they focus on in order to take care of what they're mo most passionate about. Well said, well said. And, and that's where, again, that research is good to have. Uh, if you're if you're in a discussion with a group or a person and they're saying, I'd rather spend my time on this issue, um, you can bring out your stats. You can bring out that Princeton article that said, you know, the, 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 the desires and the wishes of all these people are meaningless because you have a 0% effect because of this issue. Um, Gary, real quick. Yeah. Um, an another hurdle I think can come up with rollouts is sometimes they just won't actually amount to anything. I uh, speak specifically about uh, Initiative 735 in Washington State, which uh, I'm like I think a lot of people put a, a lot of effort for that, but uh, it can't. It passed four years ago, and I haven't really heard anything come of it. Uh, like once it passed and was voted on, I don't think Congress really did anything with it. I think one of the big problems with it is that it didn't include specific language. And when I researched it, all the really all the articles I found about it were that it was a nice attempt, but it was an attempt. Sure. Then, then I would say call attention to that and then bring it back to this, bring it back to this issue of, well, perhaps legislature is doing a job, but that job uh, won't be successful when, you know, the power of the money says otherwise. Hank, you had your hand up. Uh, if you could unmute real quick or talk closer to the mic. How's that? That's perfect. Okay, good. Um, one of the things that that we've thought about uh, here, here with the group here in Lansing, Michigan, is, is along the same lines that people are talking about in terms of uh, notions of, if you will, policy areas and their being um, impacted by, by dark and big money. Um, and they're recognizing it. it. Our observation has been that part of the comp, there's an there's a obstacle to getting those groups to really kind of switch their, their percentage, if you will, uh, and put more emphasis on, on money than they do. Uh, part of that has to do with the fact that so many policy areas suffered setbacks in the last four years, and people are manically trying to recover. And it is impossible to jump beyond recovery. Um, and so one of the things that we, we've put together, but I will admit that this has been very slow to really get it going, um, is to have a, a partnership with one of those groups to assist them in doing some digging around areas where they are aware that money 
and big interests and so forth have actually impacted them and then get and help them get some of the data and if you will fill in the picture now this takes some people that that are willing to do a little bit of research in this you know the state elections file and the fec and so forth uh, but what it does do is put you in a position that if you can get something like that they will put that it that matter in their their house organs and their communication vehicles that will be telling people that money matters in the ways in which those people can hear from the people they're used to hearing from. And the other long-term effect of that is you're developing partnerships. Uh, when it comes time to uh, really mobilize people as we, uh, when the 20th Amendment shows up and we've got to really you know, put the heat on our legislatures to basically ratify the thing, mm -hmm. uh, this, this puts you in a position to have a much broader uh, a base of uh, participants, if you will. So, at any rate, it 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 tends to give you a deeper relationship, but it's it's slow going, particularly right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a good point to they may call on you for the data, and if you've got good research, if you've got if you've done your homework, uh, you may be called to testify. You may be brought into your state legislature uh, to a committee to say why this didn't happen, and you've got you know you can demonstrate the spending, and you can say here's why policies aren't happening or here's why they're not happening the way they should. So again, this is, if your campaign has great data and great people, good spokespeople, you're in a good position. Um, let me, we're running out of time actually. So let me uh, roll into, uh, back to the rollout. Uh, I wanna point out um, earned media. There's two types of media, uh, you all probably are aware, but there's the paid media, uh, which you know you pay for your ads, you pay for, social media, you, you pay to get the attention. There's also earned media. And so what you need, what, what works best is when you have any of your events, your rollout or any subsequent event, try to get as much of the earned media as possible. Um, but earned media is harder to get. Earned media is like, like it says in the name, it's earned. And you'll earn it from having a high profile event, some large enough event that you get the media's attention or high profile people. And so that's where you go back to the networking. Once you do your rollout, hopefully uh, you've come up on the radar with, uh, you know, you've got some high profile organizations that are backing you. You've got some high profile people that are involved with you and uh, they're part of your chapter. They, they are clearly, you know, they have the same goal as you. Uh, perhaps you've got former governors of your state. Perhaps you've got present governors, uh, legislators past and present. You've got some great business leaders um, even a local celebrity, you know, if you've got that, use that, capitalize on that, and now capture all of the free earned media that you can. Um, the profile you're building now, it should be able to create a virtuous cycle of news. It should be able to say, you're up on the map now, uh, your chapter is working to get money out of politics, and look at how much you've accomplished, and that creates a cycle of this media or this event rolls into the next. So you wanna roll this, leverage this, and continue that virtuous cycle so that you get more events, more media, more legislators, more requests to be on, you know, in your state legislature, or even be, you know, called up to Capitol Hill. All of this happens by leveraging the things that you have to get more things that you need. Um, using the, the profile that you've got, to earn yourself a higher profile in your state so that you can get your state ready to ratify. Um, some of the specific uh, examples of some interactive uh, events that you can have are obviously a Zoom event. If you've got some information, if you've got some celebrity, uh, business leader, um, legislator, publicize that and have a Zoom event. Uh, if you do have a Zoom event, you know, we. We at AP, I want to help you with that. So let us know and we'll get it onto the calendar. We want to make sure that that's public and we can do anything that we can to assist you in making your Zoom event as successful as possible. But before you do a, a, an interactive event like that, um, there are a couple of things that go into getting the right speakers. Uh, again, I mentioned the research, always do good research. Uh, is there some high profile type that you can have talking about corruption in politics. Uh, do you have a member of Congress that's already supportive of the language of the 20th Amendment 
and they want to get involved with your event. They want to they want to be a speaker. They want to um, do a debate. They want to sit on a panel with you. Get them in to this interactive event, and then advertise it. Make sure that people are aware that you've got Congressman so and so, and he's going to sit on the panel to discuss big money and how we can clean it up. Um, is there an industry that is affected by the, the poor legislation coming out of Congress? Uh, is the fishing industry drying up? Is, is your you know, town mill uh, no longer uh, employing people because, because of tariffs, because of whatever? Get those people to your event and have them speak. Have them talk about the effects of money in politics and how the only solution that you can see is getting the money out of politics. Also, I wanna say there's, there's, it's a gold mine to network. I, I jokingly say six degrees of, of Kevin Bacon. Uh, you may not know these high profile people, but people you know may know them or people that you meet may know someone who knows someone. So network, Net, we've done network before, but network, uh, try to find out, does anybody happen to know the Senator? Does anybody happen to, do you have a kid that goes to the same school as the governor's kid, you know, try to use your network as a resource to bring more people in, bring them to these events, then advertise the events, promote the events, and then get the event out there uh, in the public sector, in the public sphere. Finally, I wanna talk about after the event and leveraging into making something more because we are running out of time. Um, what are some of your thoughts? What are some of the things, so you've had a great event, an interactive event, maybe a town hall with a, you know, a former governor and he, talk, he, he or she talks specifically about, the, about what it was like when people were lobbying and it was a great event. What do you do now? Any, anybody, what do you do after to leverage for another high profile event or just more, more, more interest in the uh, 20th amendment? getting late in the night, I'll, I'll help you with that. Uh, take that volunteer that's great at writing. You got op-eds, write the op-eds, uh, write stories, letters to the editor. Uh, you can just find all of the media partners that you have met with and communicate with them and find out if you can, you can get a story on the, the nightly news or on the radio. Maybe you can do a, a radio discussion or even a podcast. Um, participate in a legislative meeting town halls, uh, anything where your delegate, your, your, your Congress members, your senators, your reps, if they're going to do something, participate, participate, be the advocate for this amendment. Um, you can get people to invite you to their professional networks. Like you mentioned, you've got uh, Rotary. Uh, you, you might have other professional organizations that will let you come in, make a presentation. Again, you're leveraging your, your, campaign so that you can grow it. Um, you can even hold a very public petition gathering, like you said, at a county fair, have your table set up, and then be there gathering signatures, educating people on the amendment, educating people on American Promise and how we can get big money out of politics. Um, and you can always call your local news team and invite them. Invite them to, hey, we got a table at the state fair. Uh, we'd love for you to come by. Don't hesitate to, to use these contacts. Call them, ask them, invite them. You might be surprised. Um, Azar asked me to give you a specific example of an event from me and I'll try to sum it up. Uh, but as I mentioned, I had run uh, a couple of campaigns, but in one of the campaigns, um, the event, my event that we were planning for was that I wanted to release a statement of endorsement from no fewer than 50 high profile former legislators, high profile business leaders. And so, we did that. We used a, a great uh, networking um, tool. We, we brought as many people. I didn't know all these people, but eventually because I knew someone who knew someone, I was able to get a couple of actual former governors. I couldn't get the present governor because he was a friend of mine, but he, he wouldn't have been an endorser. I got a couple of former U.S. senators. Uh, I got two ag secretaries. I got the U.S., a former U.S. ag secretary to endorse my campaign. Uh, we had a hundred of what they called the traditional Republicans for common sense. So I'm an independent running with the endorsement of a hundred traditional Republicans. Um, I got people on the state school board. I got people um, uh, with the, 
but you know, uh, environmentalists, I had all these people. Uh, so the event was a reading of the endorsement and the statement on the Topeka Capitol steps. We invited the press, uh, the press that didn't show up. What we did was we, we got as much time on the air and in the, in the newspapers as we could. And then those that didn't show up, we drove around and we stopped in and said, hey, you missed the event, but we have time for a quick interview. So from the event, we went and we expanded to get more time in front of the, the public. And it worked because they knew, well, this event happened on the steps. We'll take a few minutes to put, you know, to put this guy and his campaign on the news. And it worked. Um, and from that, then we took as many snips, as many sound bites, as many cuts of the nightly news. And we bought some social media and we distributed it widely. Uh, and then we put a couple of ads into the newspapers in the targeted areas. So whatever the event is, however important you think it is, or even if, if it's not well attended, you can leverage it to get more from that event. You can, you can take that one thing and parlay that into so many more things if you stay on top of it and if you use your network. And again, if you have good, good data, good research. Um, that's, that's my portion. Uh, we have an example. Uh, Azer, did you want to show the example of uh, the chapter that got the, um, the debate question in, inserted into uh, Senator Collins's debate? Um, you know, I, I just think, I think to be respectful of everyone's time, I'll, I'll put it in the chat and, and we can include it in the recap email here. You know, the, you know, final thing to really think through as you look at, okay, maybe, you know, the example we used was we're, we'll have our campaign goal be specifically around winning the support of a member of Congress um, from undecided or no to, to yes on this amendment. And, you know, uh, around election time is the, the time that we really want to be at a fever pitch in our campaign, making sure that this is an amendment issue. So all of your activities are, are building to this. Um, and we'll, we'll include a, you know, one or two minute video of, you know, the question, you know, being point black, point blank asked to a member of Congress, do you support this? This amendment, and you know, the, the point being here is debates are a powerful way um, that we can really directly make this an election issue. So, um, yeah, we can include that in in the recap email. Um, but as always, um, and these calls on time. Th thank you for leading on us in this, Alan, and there will be a recording of it. Um, and thank thank you all for for participating and, and sharing your insights. As always, um, I hope this training series has, has added some, some strategic overlay to, to all of the other resources at American Promise. You know, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, but it's one, one more ho hopefully useful tool to, to support your guys' work across the country, which, you know, it's, it's the work of, of true heroes. Um, there's no other way to, to put it. So um, thanks. Thank, thank you, you Azar. Thank you. This is the last time we're going to see you. Thank you so right. much. Good luck. I think Good I need to give a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Until we see you again. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. Don't be yeah. a stranger. That's right. I, I won't. Uh, thanks, you guys. Uh, Azer, really you nice. mentioned you would be in Western Washington sometime this fall, right? Y yep. Yeah. Uh, did you want to get my email address so we could possibly coordinate an event or something? Or please, yeah. You know, if you, you want to put it, if you want to put it in the chat here, Gary. Um, I'll send you a quick note right now and, and we can be in purposeful touch about that. Yeah. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Great. Super. Thanks, Gary. All right. Well, I'll email you right now. All right. Thanks, you guys. I'm going to end Thank this you. Thank you. Bye, Azor. everybody. Bye. Take care, Azor. Bye-bye. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, you guys.